Do you have so many chores that you wish there was more of you? Well, it's time for you to take a break because it's tea time. So pour yourself a nice hot cup of tea and we'll grab this issue of the Walla Walla Garden City Gazette. October 27th, 1894. E.H. Orcott of Palouse City is in Walla Walla. It is rumored that F.W. Kayser has a second-hand marriage license for sale. Major Michael Cooney, 4th Cavalry, has been granted a one-month's leave of absence. Corporal George Murray, 4th Cavalry, has been reduced to the ranks for absence without leave and conduct prejudicial to good order and military discipline. A number of hunting parties made their way into the surrounding wilds last Sunday for ducks. The birds were delusive, however, and a few were bagged. The Guileless Indian. He is a minister and not versed in the ways of cities. The Reverend James Sotley, a full-blooded Indian who ministers to his race in Manitoba, started from his northern home a week ago to visit Archdeacon Kirkley of Rye, New York. On the way to Chicago, he met a stranger who relieved him of his cash and left him penniless and friendless in that wicked city. When he arrived in Chicago Saturday evening, he did not know the way to the Grand Central Depot. He asked a policeman and was directed to the station house where, he says, he was promptly locked up until morning. The next day, a policeman accompanied the guileless preacher to the depot, bought him a ticket and gave him 50 cents, taking his watch as security. The man promised to return the watch to the Rye Rectory, but it has not done so yet. Clever Scheme Port towns in Washington. The customs and immigration officials here today stumbled upon a scheme whereby it is estimated that at least 500 pauper Japanese have been admitted this year. The only restriction the immigration law imposes is that each applicant for admissions shall possess $30. Arriving here, the Japanese are taken to the custom house, examined, and as they have the requisite amount of money, they are passed. It was discovered that a man who had passed and showed the agent his $30, when leaving, secretly passed it to the next awaiting applicant. The rest were taken out to the hallway and searched, and it was found that there was but $30 in the whole crowd. How dear to my heart is cash on subscription when generous subscribers present it to view. But the man who won't pay will refrain from description, for perhaps, gentle reader, this man might be you. Young America in Chicago Of all the queer ways of making a living, two Chicago boys have the queerest. It is so queer that it smacks of swindling. A well-dressed little man at the Randolph Street corner of Fifth Avenue stopped for a moment to allow a car to pass. While he was standing there, a boy edged up behind him and hooked onto his coat tail a card which was printed in black letters, SOLD. As the man went across the street, several persons saw it and turned to laugh at him. The second boy was waiting across the street. He ran up to the man and said, Mister, there's a card hooked to your coat behind. Let me take it off. Goodness me, said the little man. How did that get there? One of them tough kids put it on, I guess. Confound them. Well, here, boy, here's a dime for you. Thanks, mister. Two minutes later, 
A good little boy hung it on another man, and his partner on the other side of the street intercepted the man and collected a nickel. He had to ask for it, but he got it. A man would be a brute to refuse a nickel to a poor boy who has just done him a great service. <laughs> Kayser Davis Wedding Fred W. Kayser and Miss Laura Davis were married at the residence of the bride's parents in Umatilla County Sunday afternoon. Rev. R. F. Powell, pastor of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church of this city, performed the ceremony. The groom is a junior partner of the well-known firm of Davis and Kayser. The bride is the daughter of John Davis, the senior partner, whose home is eight miles southeast of Walla Walla. The couple took the evening train for Portland, where they will spend their honeymoon. They will reside in this city. Residence Burned The residence of W.R. Townsend, who lives on his fruit ranch northwest of the city, was burned to the ground Monday morning at 3 o'clock. Mr. Townsend and family were visiting in Umatilla County at the time. Some of the neighbors attempted to save the furniture, but were too late. The house was a two-story structure, and it and the contents were a total loss. Insured in the Home Mutual Insurance Company for $700, the loss was about $2,000. Thus will a man and his whole family rave when happy home clothing their trouble might save. I made love, and I'm not sorry that I married. How it was done. The romance of a Walla Walla boy told to a Gazette reporter. My Gladys Hightone, the perfect girl, she liked the odor of roses. Many people have wondered how such a homely man as myself managed to capture so perfectly lovely and highly accomplished girl as Gladys Hightone. Gladys was certainly a very perfect girl. In my race for her hand, I had many competitors, men who outclassed me in wealth, appearance, and social position. Gladys scorned me at first, but when I captured one entrenchment, I made it a point to gain another and finally distanced my rivals. Since Gladys and myself are happily married, I have no hesitancy in divulging the secret of my success in competing for a fair hand to my masculine friends. A very few days after my introduction to her, I sent her an exquisite bouquet with my compliments. A week later, I sent her another, and this continued for a month. This method caused her to form an interest in the donor and wonder what his motive might be in presenting the flowers. With the last bouquet, I sent a note expressing a desire to call upon her at her home. The request was answered in the affirmative. I, on the appointed evening, arrayed myself faultlessly in my best attire and had the barber give me the best haircut and shave he had in the shop. I stood before my glass for half an hour before I left my room, practicing salutations and the most pleasant facial expressions I had in stock. Of course, I rode to her home in a hack. I was met at the door by a servant to whom I gave my card and was ushered into the luxurious parlor. Pretty soon Gladys appeared and she looked bewitching in a gown that I am sure would have been designed by no one but Worth. We had a very pleasant conversation and I could see that I was making a favorable impression with the pretty phrases and compliments I had so arduously rehearsed beforehand. I could sing a little and Gladys played while I warbled. 
Then we talked again for a few minutes, at the end of which time I related a little anecdote that I had reserved for the last, which pleased the young lady immensely. I saw that I had created a deep interest in her for me, and I concluded to leave while my credit was good. I waited a week before I visited her again. A man should make a girl anxious to see him, you know. Nothing blights a man's hopes more than to be forever at the side of the lady he adores. Gladys appeared very happy to see me and opened the door herself for my entrance. The call was a little less formal this time, and as I had new set of anecdotes, I kept her deeply interested. I indulged in some small compliments, praising her good taste in various matters, said her voice was superb, when in point of fact it was rather deficient, said she appeared very neat, and that she was my ideal of what a woman should be. She blushed at the latter remark, but I could see that it pleased her. Before I called again upon the object of my affections, I invested in the most expensive box of bonbons I could procure and sent them to her. She was very glad to see me the next time I called, and I noticed that she had taken extra pains to appear beautiful in my eyes. I talked in quite a sensible vein to her mother, studying her hobbies and agreeing with her in each and every one of them, which caused the dear old lady to become quite infatuated with me. I didn't care a snap about her father. If I had the balance of the family on my side, that was enough. After some hesitation, she finally said the word that has made me happy ever since. Of course, her father objected, but I am now in his employ, drawing a salary twice as large as he would pay anyone else for the same services. You can readily see that he had come to terms. There, boys, you see how it's done. The Editorial We an exchange says, somebody who wants to explain what the editorial we signifies, says it has a variety of meanings, varied to suit the circumstances. For example, when you read that we expect our wife home today, we refers to the editor-in-chief. When it is we are a little late with our work, it includes the whole office force. To say, we are having a boom, the town is meant. We received over 7 million immigrants last year, embraces the nation. But when we say we have hog cholera in our midst, only means that the man who takes the paper and does not pay for it is very ill. Thank you.